I now invite you to join me in confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake, God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We now sing our opening hymn.
the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, in peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy for the reign of God and for peace throughout the world, for the unity of all. Let us pray. Let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for planting in us the seed of your word. By your Holy Spirit, help us to receive it with joy, live according to it, and grow in faith and hope and love. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Now it's time for the children's sermon. And just for this occasion, I brought with me my handy dandy trusty box of band-aids. You know what these are good for, don't you? Cuts, scrapes, maybe mosquito bites. But what if I had cancer? Would this band-aid be very good for my cancer? Maybe it could help me heal up if I had surgery, but it didn't get to the root of the problem. You see, band-aids are good for some hurts, but they don't get to the source of many illnesses. In our first lesson today, St. Paul talks about the deep problem of sin and its root. He calls it a lifetime of brutal tyranny because sin is a system. It's like a sickness that traps us in. It takes over. It even co-ops good things, like the law code given to Moses, and turns it into a support for the system. We can try our best to be good, but we can't get outside the system. We can't get beyond the sickness by ourselves. Anytime we try to heal ourselves, it's like putting a band-aid on cancer. It might promote some healing on the outside, but it doesn't heal us deep on the inside. But God sent Jesus as more than a band-aid. Jesus gets to the root of the problem. He is the medicine that treats the causes of our illnesses whether they're systemic, personal, or otherwise. He is the life that is the antidote to death. He is the fresh air that clears out all the stale and unhealthy air and promotes wellness for everyone. Here now, this reading from Romans, where we hear St. Paul talk about Jesus, who's more than a band-aid. The translation is from this 
book called The Message. It's a Bible paraphrase. And I commend both Romans chapters 7 and 8 to you. They are powerfully told in this version. It is indeed good news. We know we're sick. We know we're stuck in a sin system. But God gave us more than a band-aid. We have Jesus, the healer of our every ill. Amen. We continue now with the reading from scripture. A reading from Romans. With the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, that fateful dilemma is resolved. Those who enter into Christ's being for here, being here for us, no longer have to live under a continuous low-lying black cloud. A new power is in operation. The spirit of the spirit of life in Christ, like a strong wind, has magnific has magnificently cleared the air, freeing you from a faded lifetime of brutal tyranny at the hands of sin and death. God went for the jugular when he sent his own son. He didn't deal with, with the problem as something remote and unimportant. In his son, Jesus, he personally took on the human condition, entered the distorted, disordered mess of struggling humanity in order to set it right once and for all. The law code, weakened as it always was by fractured human nature, could never have done that. The law always ended up being used as a band-aid on sin instead of deep healing of it. And now what the law could ask for but we couldn't deliver is accomplished as we, instead of redoubling our own efforts, simply embrace what the Spirit is doing in us. Those who think they can do it on their own end up more, end up obsessed with measuring their own moral muscle, but never get around to exercising it in real life. Those who trust God's action in them find that God's spirit is in them. Living and breathing God. Obsession with self in these matters is a dead end. Atten attention to God leads us out into the open, into a spacious free life. Focusing on the self is the opposite of focusing on God. Anyone completely absorbed in self ignores God, ends up thinking more about self than God. That person who ignores God ignores who God is and what he is doing, and God isn't pleased at being ignored. But if God himself has taken up residence in your life, you can hardly be thinking more of yourself than him. Anyone, of course, who has not welcomed the invisible but clearly present God, the Spirit of Christ, won't know what we're talking about. But for those of you, but for you who have welcomed him in whom he dwells, even though you still experience all the limitations of sin, you yourself experience life on, on God's terms. It stands for a reason, doesn't it, that if the alive and present God who raised Jesus from the dead moves into your life, he'll do the same thing in you that he did in Jesus, bring you alive to himself. When God lives and breathes in you, and he does as surely as he did as he, in Jesus, you are delivered from that dead life. From his, with his spirit living in you, your body will be as alive as Christ's, the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. According to Matthew. Glory to you, O Lord. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the sea. Such great crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat there while the whole crowd stood on the beach. And he told them many things in parables, saying, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, 
Some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Other seeds fell on rocky ground, where they did not have much soil, and they sprang up quickly since they had no depth of soil. But when the sun rose, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered away. Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Anyone with ears to hear, listen. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what is sown in the heart. This is what was sown on the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet such a person has no root, but endures only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, that person immediately falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but the cares of the world and the lure of wealth choke the word and it yields nothing. But as for what was sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it, who indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another 60, and in another 30. The word of the Lord. Thanks Praise God. to you, Lord. Other seeds fell on good soil and brought forth grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, some thirty. Anyone with ears to hear, listen. In November of 1970, a chaplain at the University of Maryland was ordained in the university chapel. It was a festive affair with ecumenical colleagues and denominational heads in attendance, full of scripture and hymn singing and words of exhortation. It was history in the making, for the ordinand was Elizabeth Platz, the first Lutheran woman to be ordained in the Western Hemisphere. As with all historic moments, this ordination was the result of many seeds planted over the years. Women's organization in the Lutheran Church had been providing leadership and training opportunities for women for decades. Women were included as missionaries sent abroad by the Lutheran Church around the world. Lutherans were among those who were responding to the women's movement in the broader culture. Lutherans were questioning the long-standing prohibition of women voting in churches and serving on church councils. Theologians from multiple seminaries studied the issue, but strangely, none of these theological panels included women, even though the question at hand was the role of women in the church. Nonetheless, the seeds that were planted in women and in our church from all over the country were taking root due to the efforts of many women and men over the decades tilling the soil. This year of 2020, we are celebrating 50 years of women's ordination in our church. The seeds of this ministry were planted in the soil of New England Synod too. This photo that you will see in a second is from the New England Synod's women in ministry retreat that happened annually for about 25 years. This photo is from 1992. Now, many of you will know two of the women in this photo. The first is in the back row, fourth from the left. She's got glasses and kind of curly hair that's, that frames her face. That's Reverend Vera Arndt Bush. Pastor Bush was the second woman to be ordained in the New England Synod. It was tough for women in those days to find placements. And in fact, Vera had trouble finding an internship placement. Many churches didn't want women in their pulpits. 
But did you know that St. Matthew, our church, stepped forward to be the internship site for Pastor Vera? And later, when Pastor Bush retired, she made St. Matthew her home congregation. And during her years of membership at St. Matthew and in the Greater Hartford Conference of Lutheran Churches, she inspired many of us women to go forward in ministry with her example and her prayerful life. The second person you might recognize is the farthest on the right. It's Krisha Robinson, longtime music director here and rostered leader in the New England Synod. Her ministry is church music and more. On Sunday mornings in the church, uh, children's choir rehearsals, co-teaching education classes, Krisha was planting seeds of care and spiritual nourishment in the choir and in the congregation alike. The year that that photo was taken was the same year I came to New England for ministry, for seminary actually, because seeds had been planted in me. Seeds that were planted by people like Elaine Ramshaw, the leader of the assisting ministers in my home congregation in Columbus, Ohio, who invited me as a high schooler to lead the prayers in church and told me that I had a natural presence at the altar. It was seeds planted by Pastor Mary Hammond, the American Baptist minister in my college town, who showed me what ministry looked like from a woman's perspective, modeled authentic faith, and shared her deep love of Jesus with me. Now, I was born in 1970, the year that women were ordained in the Lutheran church for the first time. So from a theoretical perspective, there has never been a time in my lifetime where I would not have been allowed to be a pastor. Nonetheless, it wasn't until I was 21 years old that a woman pastor put the communion bread into my hand. I wept at the beauty of seeing for the first time what I could become. I think of the women in the photo that I showed you, as well as the other women who went before me. Women who hand altered men's clergy shirts because there was no space for a woman's figure inside. Women who camped outside of men's bathrooms because there were none in that seminary building for them. Women who were overlooked for internships and first calls and larger parishes who were paid less than their younger male counterparts. Women who had to prove themselves at every meeting, every sanctuary, and at every bedside. Even though we all believe the words of the prophet Joel repeated at Pentecost. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. I stand on the shoulders of these trailblazing women, and I am so grateful for their tenacity and faith. I am so grateful to God for the privilege of continuing to plant the seeds that were first planted in me. That's why I want to tell you today about the other anniversaries that we celebrate in this year, 2020, in the ELCA. 2020 is the 50th anniversary of ordination of women in our church but it is also the 40th anniversary of the ordination of the first woman of color in our church and the 10th anniversary of the vote to remove barriers to ordination for gay, lesbian, bisexual, and transgendered persons. Like the parable in today's lesson, God the sower casts seed into all kinds of places. 
People and ministries unimagined a generation or two ago are now blossoming. Right here in Greater Hartford, we have two Spanish-speaking ministries, one at our partner church, Grace Lutheran, headed up by Pastor Alba Perez, and one at Nuevo Creación in Manchester, led by Reverend Persida Rivera Mendez. Some of our most creative and talented new pastors are LGBTQ persons, including the wonderful pastor, Rachel Anderson, whom I had the privilege of mentoring in my former congregation. These are people whom the Lord, through hands like yours, has planted the seeds of the kingdom, who are now sowing more seeds in all kinds of soil. This is exactly the kind of multiplication that Jesus talks about, that bears fruit and abundant yield, in one case a hundredfold, and another sixty, and another thirty. But truth be told, the soil is not always ready for the seeds that God has to sow. Ten years after the ordination of women, there was so much resistance to women pastors that many thought the decision might be reversed. Our former Bishop Margaret Payne said at that time, too often when female clergy meet and share, the air is filled with anger, frustration, and pain. The stories are sad. The discrimination is outrageous. And the joy comes mostly from sharing little moments of warmth with a kindred soldier before leaping back into battle. Today, there is much less discrimination against white women clergy in our church, but it is still rough going for women pastors of color and clergy who are LGBTQ. Less than 10% of our clergy women are women of color and they continue to experience race and gender prejudice in our church, as by the disproportionate wait time for their first calls compared to their white counterparts, both male and female. Clergy who identify as gay, lesbian, bisexual, or transgender also have a hard time finding calls in our church. The New England Synod has welcomed LGBTQ clergy but many synods remain unable to fully embrace their ministry since their congregations are unwilling to consider an LGBTQ candidate. And as such, there are many seeds that are ready to take root and flourish, but they are choked out by the fear of others. There are many seeds that are ready to germinate, but instead they lay dormant on the hearts packed hard by discrimination. To see someone like myself reflected in the leadership of my church is really important to me. And it's what I've been reflecting on on this 50th anniversary of the ordination of women. Because for me, this isn't just about who is allowed to be clergy. It's about who is welcome in the Lutheran church. I want our youth, our members of all races and genders and sexual orientations to have the same privilege that I had, to see themselves reflected in our church leadership and membership, to see themselves as fully worthy and fully included, to believe that they can be authentically themselves and authentically followers of Christ at the same time. I want them to catch a glimpse of what they might become as a part of the body of Christ. I don't want any more ungerminated seeds without a place to take root in our church. We have a lot of tilling to do. Breaking up the soil and removing the weeds takes considerable study, prayer, effort, and action. But we are already on the way. You welcomed Vera. You mentored Kurt. 
Some are exploring faith-based community organizing in our area. And some are planning a book study on racism. Others are intentionally inviting youth to be a part of our ministry. And still others are sending cards to our elderly members who can't get out in this time of pandemic. It all adds up. It is all part of sharing the good news of the kingdom that each person is unique and beloved and a child of God called to carry out the kingdom work of just mercy and justice and love in this world. Together, we are planting seeds of the kingdom and trusting that God will give the growth. Amen. We now confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born on the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please join us now in the prayers of intercession. Each petition will end with the words, Hear us, O God and the congregation may respond, your mercy is great. 
called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Gracious God, your word has been sown in many ways and places. We give you thanks for the seeds planted in our hearts and in our community. We pray for all who long to use their gifts in the church that they would find a place of welcome. Inspire us by their witness to the faith we share. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Creating God, the mountains and hills burst into song and the trees and fields clap their hands in praise. We pray for the birds and animals who make their home in the trees and for lands stripped bare by deforestation. Empower us to sustainably use what you have given. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Reigning God, we pray for our nation's leaders. Increase their desire for justice and equality. Bridge the chasms that divide us and guide authorities to a lasting peace rooted in justice. Hear us, O oh God. Your, Your mercy, mercy is great. Abiding God, care for all who are in need, especially Judy, Meg, Judy, Meg, Susan, Dorothy, Susie, the, fa the Maggie family for the loss of Tom, for, for Kurt as he continues his ministry training, and also pray to be open to each person we meet through our days of living. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Renewing God, revive your church in this place. Sustain our ministries during this time of pandemic that we might deepen our trust in you and grow in our relationships with the wider community. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. great. Eternal God, we give thanks for all who have died, especially those we name before you silently. Comfort us in the sure and certain hope of the resurrection. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O oh God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now receive this blessing. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God, the Creator, Jesus, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. We now sing our sending hymn.
Go forth into the world to serve God with gladness. Be of good courage. Hold fast to that which is good. Render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Support the weak. Help the afflicted. Honor all people. Love and serve God, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God.